Kitco News Outlook 2024 is brought to you by iTrust Capital. Buy and sell crypto, gold and silver with your IRA. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safran and this is Kitco News. Now today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the world of commodities focusing on gold, silver and and oil. Now, the commodities market has been a hive of activity recently with significant movements across these key assets. Gold, of course, hit a record high in December of about $2,100 an ounce, while silver has been attracting investors during these volatile times. And we're also keeping an eye on oil prices. Now, to discuss these dynamics and give us an outlook at what lies ahead for 2024, we're joined by Gary Wagner. He's our expert in charts and commodity forecasts. Gary, welcome to the show. Let's chart it out. Thank you so very much for having me. Happy New Year to all of our viewers. And it's great to be back on Kitco at the beginning of the year. Love it. Well, we're happy to have you. I mean, 2024 is no doubt starting out fairly interesting. Now, Today, we saw the Fed just release their minutes saying, OK, we are doing all right on the inflation train, not quite at that 2 percent, but don't expect rate cuts rather to immediately take effect in 2024. They're looking at maybe towards the end of the year. Now, much of the market has already priced in a few of these cuts. So I'm curious, Gary, as we see the Federal Reserve transitioning from quantitative tightening to potential easing. Gold prices have shown a marked response. With the policy shift and gold's current valuation, I mean, what's your perspective in gold here throughout 2024? It seems we're in a little bit of a corrective stage today. Absolutely, and it's actually something I had hoped for. But in terms of my overall outlook, I'm exceedingly bullish. I'll talk about where I'm looking at as potential upside. But with the Fed's announcement in December, that they are in fact pivoting from a monetary policy that includes rate hikes and then maintaining those high rates elevated for a long time. That was, quote, Jerome Powell's doctrine, uh, longer and higher. And he announced for the first time that starting in this year, there would be a series of rate cuts. And that's an exceedingly strong and important pivot Market participants have been waiting for that for quite some time. I believe that there's over optimism as to when those will actually get enacted. There's a lot of talk about, we believe the first one will be in March. My senses, and this is simply going by the SCP, which is the summary of uh, economic projections or the dot plot that was released in December, that it's going to be probably near the mid or end of Q2, before we see any rate cuts. And secondly, what he mentioned, Powell, was that there would be a series of quarter percent rate cuts, three of them uh, totaling a cut of three quarters of a percent to Fed funds rates. Mm -hmm. You know, you're showing this chart here. I want to get back into your outlook for 2024. Explain to the audience a little bit about how your fundamentals worked here, how the technicals worked, and how you got there. Well, I've been doing this for a while. I was classically trained in Western analytical tools, but I gravitated fairly quickly into some of the Eastern studies, such as Japanese candlesticks. Before that, I worked with things like Fibonacci retracement, Elliott wave, and kind of discounted things like stochastics and RSI. I still use moving average. But my technique has always been uh, the big picture. So I begin with the fundamentals. I look at what's going on in terms of events and how they might influence the price of a stock or commodity. And then I use technicals for specific entry, exits, and targets. So I call that a hybrid trader. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, to tell us what we're seeing on this chart, Gary, and where you think that this market will be going. Well, this is a daily candlestick chart of gold. And what I have plotted basically is a Fibonacci retracement. And the reason for doing that is as this market hit this high, and of course, this is back at the beginning of December 4th on a Monday, it came down with a pretty strong correction to approximately 1985 and then began to cycle higher moving as high as about 
oh, well, well over 2000. But once the new year started, we saw some weakness in the market. Today is a strong day down. And so what these dash lines here represent different Fibonacci important levels to watch. This one here, which is where the current pricing is at, 2049, is based on a 38.6% retracement. Typically, when you look at Fibonacci, what we're looking at is, first of all, his sequence, which is a very easy formula. You start with zero and one, you add them, you get one. Um, then you go one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, and so forth. And all of our viewers are familiar with that when they think about a Nautilus shell, the way it revolves. And the reason that is such an important technique is that the relationship between each of those numbers is 0.618% or 1.618%. To give you a visual illustration, it appears it's a blueprint of nature. So when you look at my hand, for example, this digit right here compared to this digit, this digit is compressed by 0.618, 0.618. So it's nature's way of growth, so to speak. And the financial markets picked it up years ago and found some real relevancy in it. So we're looking at where could gold drop to because my sense is this will be a short-term correction, not that deep, and it will return to a bullish demeanor. So if it breaks through this level at 2048, the next level I would look at is 50%, which is not a FIB number, but used. That's at 2018 and a deep retracement would come down to about 1987, and I'm not expecting it to go that deep. But that, in essence, is how we use uh, Fibonacci retracements. Interesting. Now, we have no crystal bar here, but looking towards the future with the correction that happened today, uh, where are you anticipating first quarter, second quarter for gold to go here? Timing is more difficult than price projection. My projection by year end is between uh, $2,200 and $50 and about $3,200. And that was based upon uh, doing what's called a Fibonacci extension, which is basically putting retracement on its head. Um, and that is my forecast for 2024. So I am exceedingly bullish. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, based on your forecast, gold could obviously reach or even surpass the $2,500 per ounce mark for this year. I'm curious, though, could you detail the main factors that you believe will contribute to the rise? Absolutely. First, we talked about it briefly, was Fed monetary policy changing from quantitative easing to um, or from quantitative tightening to easing. And the reason that's important is Gold is very sensitive to interest rates. Interest rates moving up create a, a bearish undertone for it. Interest rates going down is bullish for gold. And the reason for that is gold doesn't yield any interest on it. So it becomes more of a, uh, a favorable asset to hold during times of low fixed income returns. That is going to be a process that it happens over three years because the Federal Reserve itself projected uh, 24, 25, and 26 and how they're going to bring that down and bring down inflation. Because, of course, their ultimate target is to get inflation to a 2% level. So that's exceedingly important, and that will be a multi-year process. The next thing that is really on my radar is the geopolitical tension that currently exists, we have a conflict in um, Russia and Ukraine. We have a conflict in the Middle East. And forget about Kim kind of talking about what he's going to do, but these are real issues. And in fact, when we look at what's going on in Ukraine, Russia's really ramped up the military um, activity to where they're launching tens of, or if not hundreds of missiles into Ukraine. And anytime you have an extended geopolitical rift, so to speak, 
that is going to take out the safe haven aspect. In other words, with the Federal Reserve, what we are looking at is making it favorable by lower interest rates, but safe haven is a little bit different because in times of uncertainty, gold tends to do a much better. One other thing that I think is critical to where we see gold go over the next couple of years is dollar strength or weakness. Mm -hmm. And so recently, in the big picture, we've seen the dollar hit 107 on the dollar index and slowly decline. It's been exceedingly strong. We'll look at a chart when, whenever you ask me to, but exceedingly strong over the last three days. However, what is different now than we have seen maybe 10 years ago is countries organizing together BRICS, which is a series of countries that are attempting to take the dollar and dethrone it from its status as the dominant currency for global trade. And that goes into oil because oil is traded in petrodollars. In fact, Iran and Russia signed an agreement about a week ago that they would now trade and sell oil back and forth in their local currencies. Of course, that would have a negative effect on the dollar. So it's going to be Federal Reserve monetary policy. It's going to be geopolitical landscape, dollar strength or weakness to me, are the primary factors that I'm looking at currently. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that chart before, Gary. Let's bring that chart up now and show the audience because I'm, I'm very curious, you know, when you're analyzing various chart types, well, what specific patterns or indicators do you find the most reliable for predicting market movements in gold and also in silver? Well, there's the, I use a combination. There's, there's not just one. I use Japanese candlesticks for entry levels for information on potential key reversals or pivots. I use Fibonacci extensions and retracements to chart plausible points if a market's moving up. Where is it likely to find resistance along with recent market tops? For support, I look at market bottoms along with other tools such as Fibonacci retracements at the lower end. For forecasting, especially if we're forecasting a market that has just hit a new high and, and could hit a all-time new record high, we use Fibonacci extensions. The last thing I use is called Elliott Wave, and it's either loved or hated by fellow technicians. But simply put, his philosophy or theory is that when a market goes up, or down, it doesn't go straight up or straight down. So he has broken up a bullish movement into a series of eight steps. And the first five he labels as the impulse phase, waves one, two, three, four, and five, where one is in the direction of the trend. So in a bullish market, as you can see on the screen, this would be a move up where the market's moving from 1841 up to here, and that's impulse wave number one that will be followed by a corrective period or wave two. And then you go to what's typically the longest of the impulse waves, wave three, and then a correction. The way I like to explain it is rather than a market just going parabolic, straight up or straight down, it tends to move in a series of stair steps. And so it's these stair steps that allow us a way to look at the market and ascertain where the current price is in relationship to different time cycles. So you basically look for it to go for five waves up. You can see that I've drawn this line above because this is my forecast for well above and to trade to a new price high. But before that, we're in a corrective period. We want to see if it finds support at 2050 or if it's going to go a little lower, and then we would look at 2025. So let's assume that gold continues to drop. What we want to look for at the bottoms, in other words, if you're looking at this wave down, we call it a four, you can see there's different colored candles. But right here at the bottom, they're very, very small bodied. 
And that is called a doji in terms of the candlestick type itself. The way we create a candlestick is the same as a bar chart. We use all four data points, open, low, high, and close. In a bar chart, you have a horizontal slash on the left side representing the open. And when it closes, a horizontal slash. When it closes, the difference in a candlestick is you draw a rectangle around the range between the open and close. And you color it typically green when it closes above the open and red when it closes below the open. Hmm. Which is, to me, one of the most interesting differences between the Western trader and the Eastern trader. And it's the way that they look at price movement over time. So, for example, if I said to you um, that gold closed $15 lower today, you would intrinsically assume that I'm talking about today's close in relationship to yesterday's close, correct? Right. Okay. The Japanese believe that the importance is not on a closed, closed basis. They look at every trading session as a battle and it is relationship between where the market opens during the session and closes. And that's why these individual candlesticks are so powerful. For example, this top has a two day pattern called an engulfing bearish. And that is a signal of a potential reversal to the downside. So by combining Elliott wave, Fibonacci and candlesticks, we have a system that kind of covers a lot of the bases. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it'll be interesting and fascinating to see where the resistance is here and, and where gold will settle come the end of this week. Uh, let's transition a little bit over to silver. If you could bring up that chart. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's such an interesting commodity. It's always kind of been the underdog. And I want to talk a little bit about it here. Uh, where are we going with silver? I mean, the last I looked, spot silver prices were around $23, $22.90. Uh, what's your call for 2024? Double that? That's an interesting thing to ask because the one of the key differences between gold and silver, when I started in the industry, silver was the little sister of gold, so to speak, and they both tended to move in tandem. They both were sensitive to inflation. They were both sensitive to geopolitical risk. They were both sensitive to risk on or risk off, how the equities markets were doing. However, we saw silver go to an all-time record high at about $50. The first time gold hit above 1900, middle of 2011. And then on the subsequent new price highs in gold, silver kind of fizzled out. It found a trading range that finds resistance at around $30. And so when I when you asked you, I think it's going to double. Futures right now are trading at twenty three twenty. That would be about forty three dollars. I would like to believe yes. Historically speaking, and looking at the technical data, silver has been unable to do that. Now, something has to kind of give. Many people talk about that there's a scarcity in silver. I'm not privileged to that data. But if that's the case, that would be highly supportive of it. I am looking for silver to move higher by the end of the year, but it first needs to take out $26 per ounce. Here again is a daily uh, candlestick chart of silver. You have this high that came in December 4th, the same with gold when we saw that reach an apex or a short term apex. And from there, it has come down 61% and then began to move up. Now, I'm using a data set that starts at these lows, and these lows occur in October. I call this the, the October rally. There was a geopolitical event, of course, that kind of sparked that, but that took gold substantially higher. It took silver from about $20.80 up to 26. When you look at the percentage gain in that, it's uh, quite a lot, but from there, it retraced, and if you notice, there's a line here at 61.8%. That is where silver found support. It then found resistance at 
just below the 23.6%, which occurs at $25. Now it's moving down. So I want to see if silver continues down, will it find support here? If it does, we will look for some sort of a candlestick pattern, such as this pattern here, which is basically a variation off a three river morning star. And I'd like to see if we get that bounce because as a technical trader, we're not aware of a pivot or a key reversal till it's actually already occurred. In other words, you see that V in the market. I'm trying to pick a market price point that it will find support as it's moving lower. To me, is trying to catch a hot knife um, through the air. You simply don't have the information you need to see that pivot first. And a pivot can fail. You can see a key reversal and, and that of course fails. But that's what we look for. So in terms of silver, it has been under pressure. It's currently trading down and at 2320. I want to, uh, yeah, 2320. I want to look at it at about 2290 for potential support. If, he break, if it breaks that, it would be 2200. On the upside, resistance is 25 and above that 26. Yeah, it's been so interesting. I mentioned you mentioned the geopolitical situations that kind of saw the last movement in silver. I don't think 2024 is going to uh, necessarily see a lack of geopolitical situations. It seems that there's ongoing crisis all around this world, unfortunately. But what are your, in a hypothetical situation, what should we be looking for? Is it a geopolitical situation? Where do you think we might break out of that resistance? Well, that's two questions. In terms of the geopolitical issues we have, Ukraine and Russia have been at battle, let's say, at war for almost two years, and that's an extended period of time. Typically, we have seen gold or silver move up on what I like to call saber rattling. It's threads that kind of don't result in any major conflict. There is no way that we can say that the crisis in Ukraine is a minor conflict or a short-term conflict. Um, Russia and Ukraine are at polar opposites in terms of their goals. So Ukraine has vowed to keep its sovereign nation sovereign. Russia has resolved that they're going to take back what is theirs. And it leaves very little room for a compromise that both would agree to because it's so polarized. Right. And because of that, I think that it could go on longer. I pray that it is shortened, but I personally don't see an end game just off of my head. So I believe that's going to be with us for a while. In terms of the, the Middle Eastern crisis right now, um, the Israeli government has stated this is going to be months, and this was just a few days ago, not days until we accomplish our task. And then you've got the third wild card, which is Iran and their proxy soldiers that are paid and funded by Iran in Lebanon, in the Gaza, in Yemen, in Syria, and in Iraq. And to boot, they have now been attacking military bases and I believe a couple of ships, <clears throat> which to me is exceedingly alarming. The last thing the United States wants to do, I believe, I don't know, is to have it become more of a global conflict or spread that from being a regional conflict. And I believe that Iran is attempting to do just that. So those three items could be with us for a while. And if they are, that's going to be exceedingly bullish for the price of gold, which is something I'd, ra I'd rather it be peace and gold stay stable, but gold reacts to geopolitical uncertainty and unrest. And we're certainly seeing that. Right. We cannot say we're in a time of peace. Yeah, no, unfortunately we can't. Uh, you know, we'll keep an eye on that. Obviously, Kitco News and those developments. Uh, it's always interesting to look at commodities from a geopolitical situation. I'm curious. So, at the beginning here, Gary, you were talking about the U.S. dollar, and 
I want you to bring up that chart and I want you to talk a little bit about the U.S. dollar. I mean, we've seen the greenback rise recently. Usually that's not a good thing for the gold market as we know. But I'm curious, you know, how do you think the Fed's monetary policy this year will impact the dollar in 2024? And, and what's your forecast here? Well, it, imp- to answer, it impacts it directly. Uh, the relationship between gold and the dollar is 100 percent of a negative correlation. It's inverse simply because gold is paired against the dollar in terms of its value. So when the dollar rises, gold will go down an equivalent percentage amount. And as you can see from this chart, again, it's a daily. And if we look back to July of 2023, the dollar index was roughly at 99. From there, it skyrocketed up to over 107. Now it has been at 114, it has been higher But this is relative to uh, looking at the dollar index over time, a pretty high value. And then we saw it come down really from October, the same time gold began to run up, we saw the dollar come down. It broke through a key level at around the 78% retracement right in here. This two-day pattern that I'm pointing to is known as a piercing line. And a piercing line is simply when you have a defined downtrend, you have a large red candle, which we get here. That's followed by a green candle. And again, a green candle opens and closes higher. But in this case, it opened below the closing price of the prior candle. And it it needs to close at or above the midpoint, which it did. You do not actually act on that unless you have what's called a confirming candle, which is on the following day, it's a green candle with a higher high and a higher low. So we did get that buy signal, but we are now right at a potential resistance area, which again is the 61.8% Fib retracement at about 102.50. I believe that longer term, we could see more weakness in the dollar. That certainly isn't the case over the last few days. But if you look at the decline of the dollar over this period of time, you see that it's, again, not straight down. It's basically a stair step where it might move down and it's got this hard move down here in November. And then it moves higher for five days. Then it comes and makes a lower low, goes sideways and down, finds support at the 61.8% retracement, trades as high as a 38% retracement, and it finds resistance, then begins to go lower. The reason I truly believe in using Fibonacci numbers is that you can find so many occasions in which at certain points, such as just below here, or finding resistance here, or finding support here, it is acutely accurate in many cases in determining support and resistance levels because the way that we want to look in support and resistance is they're part and parcel of the same thing. If I'm in a building complex on the second floor and I look down, that supports me. If I go to the first floor and look up, that's resistance, but it's the same floor. So support and resistance can act as the same where we'll see something be a level of resistance and then become support. But I find that a very easy technique to use to provide traders with a lot of information. I would say 90, if not 100% of the trading platforms allow you to create a, a Fibonacci retracement. If not, it can be done by hand. It's available to look it up on Google and stuff but all of the platforms actually allow you to do a Fib retracement and there is some real value there. Yeah, I mean, you're showing that spike here in October. As we saw it come off, you mentioned that there could be some resistance in and around these levels. Uh, For for the next, say, three, four months that we're not seeing on the chart there, historically, uh, where do you think this is going? Well, what we want to do is kind of compress that and give me a second to do that. So now we have a much bigger picture. So now Mm -hmm. we're going back a couple of years and these are the highs that I'm speaking about at 114. It went from 114 down to 1999. That is a 15% decline in the value of the dollar relative to the basket of currencies it trades against. And I would venture to say that this spike up here probably correlates to around a 
fifty percent of this move down. Um, if it holds the level at ninety nine, I would expect to see a bounce. If it does not, then we really need to go a little bit further back. And to do that, I simply want to convert our chart into a weekly so that we can get a, a much better idea. And to find lows below this point is pretty easy. This mm -hmm. here is 88. These lows here. Now, this, of course, is 2021 and 2020. If it does not hold this area, I would then begin to look at different tops, such as this at 98, this top here at 96. In other words, in terms of technical trading, we look at data sets over time and we look at what it did at certain price points. There's a good chance that it could hold, but if it does break this, it would be what's called a technical free fall because it could easily fall by five or 6%. Right now, we have tentative support at, at current pricing. I am not convinced long-term that that's gonna hold. I would look for dollar weakness to be prevalent throughout next year. Okay. Yeah. Great insight. I mean, it'll be interesting to watch how this plays out. Obviously, with an upcoming election year, nobody wants a bad economy as they go into power. Uh, I'm curious here. Let's talk a little bit and switch gears over to oil. No pun intended. I mean, there's been price fluctuations all over. It's had, they've had a wide ranging impact as well. I believe WTI crude currently sitting around $72, $73. Uh, what's your thoughts on the oil market coming into this year? I was exceedingly surprised to see the recent lows. I think they came in in the low 60s. Mm -hmm. And it was unusual because it wasn't uh, seasonal. I The explanation, of course, is always going to be based on supply and demand. I think that what we're looking at right now is the conflicts in the Middle East could affect the flow of oil, but then... The conflict in Russia could have affected oil and exactly the opposite occurred. In other words, it didn't seem to have a real detrimental impact on getting oil to the various countries that use it. I think the reason is, is that the countries that are having skirmishes such as Russia depends on oil sales to fund their military, to fund their ongoing things, along with their government and their social programs and whatnot. So even during periods of conflict, we have seen the flow of oil really come in unabated. And that to me was a good thing, but I didn't expect it. I would expect oil to remain between 65 and $85 throughout the year and continue to trade within that range. I think that it would take a, a black swan or unexpected event uh, to change that. Yeah, yeah. I, I I tend to agree with you, especially as the U.S. continues to bolster their reserves while buying millions of barrels uh, down there. Uh, Gary, thanks for this. Uh, your insights into the complex world of commodities have been invaluable. Of course, from gold to silver, the U.S. dollars, and a little bit of oil. Thanks for sharing your analysis and helping us navigate these financial markets. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. And uh, I think that this next year is going to provide exceptional opportunities for investors, traders, and market participants. I'm excited. I'm excited as well. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Jerry Safford for Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for the latest and download our app where you can see these prices in real time. Thanks again for joining us. Kitco News Outlook 2024 is brought to you by iTrust Capital. Buy and sell crypto, gold and silver with your IRA.